Here's a breakdown of the uh, uh, program. Uh, the, the real sort of uh, thrust of this uh, presentation was that um, I wanted to expand on some of the things that were mentioned in the um, activist orientation guide, and there's also a lot of um, uh, preconceptions that people have uh, when they're first introduced to the concept of a resource-based economy, and uh, there's caused a lot of frustration and confusion. So, our story starts in the second century when a chap called Ptolemy formulated a model of the solar system that attempted to describe the motion of the sun, the moon, and the planets. Up until that time, the main explanation for the motion of these bodies was given by Aristotle, which looked like this. Earth was placed at the center, with the planets orbiting in uniform concentric circles around it. At that time, it was simply taken for granted that Earth was at the center of the universe. But there was a problem with this, however, and Ptolemy observed that the planets, most notably Mars, had a peculiar retrograde motion that Aristotle's model couldn't account for. It threw into question the perfect circular orbits that everybody had accepted. Ptolemy sought to correct this and introduced a series of adjustments known as deference and epicycles. These were essentially a series of circles within circles uh, that the planets were fixed to. The implication of this theory was that the planets now moved in complicated geometric spirals around the Earth. But still, this was not enough to accurately predict the motion of the planets, and so more adjustments were made in order to correct variation in the retrograde loops. <laughs> the model became increasingly, increasingly complicated with equations piled upon equations in complex geometric spirals that baffled the mind. Despite initial resistance to Ptolemy's model and its flaws, the geocentric model would remain dominant for over 1,500 years, and it wasn't until the scientific revolution of the likes of Galileo, Copernicus, and Kepler. Oh, yeah. That would be called into question. <laughs> when the Sun was proposed as the centre of the solar system, the endless circles of Ptolemy's model were no longer needed. Indeed, the motion of the planets can now be described with, uh, using only a handful of simple, elegant equations. Uh, this revelation sent shockwaves around the world, and it wasn't long before the Church began to denounce the heliocentric theory and their proponents as evil. It's an observable fact. Ha, it's a, ha, right, seriously, cut it out, bro, you're making great people. Down the left. No, I'm not, bro. Want to see my proof? The church. You shut your mouth, you shut it right now. <laughs> Just as the heliocentric model was controversial because it challenged people's belief at the time, questioning concepts such as free will and property today evokes reactions of hostility. Our society seems to embrace these fully, to the point that they are accepted without question, as Isaac Pachevis points out. <laughs>
Uh, the key issue here is uh, determinism. A theory or doctrine that acts of will, occurrences in nature, or social or psychological phenomena are causally determined by preceding events or natural laws, or in the words of, uh, words of Charles Darwin, uh, everything in nature is the result of fixed laws. If we consider the human brain, we find a connection of neurological tissue that processes information in different areas of the brain with different functions. Our neurons appear to respond to predictable fact patterns firing only when particular neurochemical conditions are present in the brain. If the electrical signals of our brain obey natural laws, can the same not be said of our will that our choices are not random but follow a very specific pattern? Ah, to illustrate this, imagine playing a game of darts. If we know the laws of motion that govern the flight path of the dart, along with the initial conditions of the launch, such as the velocity, uh, pitch, spin, lift, and drag of the dart, along with information about the volume of air the dart must travel through, then we can predict where the dart will hit the board. The more information we know about the preceding events, the more accurate our prediction becomes. Indeed, the very same application of knowledge has allowed us to develop uh, our technology by observing and reacting to predictable patterns using the scientific method. If we knew all the information about the dart's launch, along with a complete knowledge of physics, we would be able to calculate exactly where it would land. We would even engineer a dart such that it always hit the bullseye. Rapid advances in neuroscience and brain imaging technology, such as MRI and PET scanning, are giving us an increasingly accurate map of the brain. Perhaps one of the most ambitious projects in neuroscience is the Human Connectome Project, uh, which aims to map all the neural connections in and synaptic pathways in the brain. If we understood all the connections present in the brain, in structure, and had an intimate knowledge of how uh, of the causal relationships between these, could we not predict the behavior of individual neurons or even the whole brain? Of course, there are probably some of uh, those of you thinking, what about the uncertainty principle? Doesn't quantum mechanics have, have something to say about causality? Uh, in principle, yes, this is true. Quantum mechanical laws, uh, which particles obey, uh, state that um, they behave in a probabilistic fashion, that is, they're determined by probabilities. But there are two issues to consider before we attribute free will to the random motion of imperceptibly small particles. Uh, firstly, they are in fact imperceptibly small, and that means that the effects of their interactions will decrease as you increase the size of the object you are dealing with. Secondly, the model is not particularly inspiring. It reduces human decision-making to a random set of probabilities. Whatever choices we make will not be ours, but the choices of quarks and electrons sitting around our brains. To address the first point, let's return to our game of darts. Technically speaking, yes, there will be a certain level of unpredictability in the darts motion. However, a dart is many times bigger than an electron or quark. And the, so those forces of uncertainty would cancel out, and any discrepancies in our predictions would be so small that it wouldn't be worth the effort. In a similar way, our brain is a macroscopic structure, and so we behave predictably, just like the dark. If this is true, what does it say about our supposed free will? Realizing that, we must then consider what exactly determines the functionality of our brains. As mentioned before, our behaviors and decisions are products of electrochemical reactions in the brain, albeit highly sophisticated reactions. The problem we are now faced with is figuring out what conditions in the, how conditions in the brain are created so that we may be, may be able to predict or modify those behaviors that are destructive, whilst amplifying those behaviors that are constructive. As we noted, by the active observations and responses active orientation guide and its sources, it's clear that our environment has a huge role in determining our personality from our behaviours to our preferences, and it shapes our lives in ways we cannot immediately perceive. For example, if you were raised in a family of a particular religious faith, in all probability, you would adopt and identify with that religion later on in life. Of course, this is all dependent on your level of exposure to ideas and information. If you're exposed to many different cultures throughout your life, or are encouraged to investigate other points of view, or both, then it becomes less certain which religion or faith you will identify with, if indeed you do at all. <laughs> In a similar way, our socioeconomic class, what kind of people we associate with, our level of education and so on, all feed into the pot, as it were. 
Numerous studies in behavioural science and sociology have shown a powerful connection between our environment and our health and behaviours. So, let's put this into a bit of a perspective and clear things up. We'll have a case study. If we look back over the last century, we find some striking examples of how human behaviour and decision making has been strongly influenced by our environment. Edward Bernays was an American propagandist that supported and advised President Woodrow Wilson during the First World War and was also the nephew of psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. Freud was convinced that human beings were susceptible to unconscious and irrational forces and articulated this theory in his book, A General Introduction to Psychoanalysis. Bernays read some of his work and was inspired. He believed, he believed that if you could use propaganda for war, then you could certainly use it for peace. He established an office in Manhattan, New York, to promote this and entitled it the Council on Public Relations. In the 1920s, he was approached by the American Tobacco Company to help advertise cigarettes to women. At that time, there was a taboo against women smoking in public, as cigarettes were fundamentally seen as a symbol of manhood. Bernays believed he could remove the taboo by appealing to the unconscious desires of the masses. And to do this, he helped, uh, he, was, uh, he solicited the help of American psychoanalyst Dr. A.A. A. Brill. Dr. Brill told Bernays that cigarettes could symbolize liberty and independence for women, and that encouraging women to smoke would be seen as a sign of equality, freeing them from a form of discrimination. With this idea, Bernays planned a demonstration for the 1929 Easter Day Parade in New York City. He instructed debutantes to march in the parade with cigarettes concealed under their clothing. When given the signal by Bernays, they were to remove the cigarettes and light them up dramatically. <laughs> the display drew the attention of the crowds and the press. The debutantes claimed they were protesting male dominance by lighting up what they called torches of freedom, and the story spread across the United States and around the world. <laughs> Bernays' legendary publicity stunt had influenced the masses and eroded the stigma of the time. It was no longer inappropriate for women to smoke in public. Cigarette sales for women rose sharply. Theatres, restaurants, and other establishments changed their policy so women could now smoke on their premises. For Bernays, it was triumphant success and made him one of the most powerful and influential men in America. Public relations transformed uh, American industry and had a profound effect on the economy. In post war America, corporations were afraid of overproduction, that supply would outstrip demand and no one will be able to buy the excess of goods being turned out by new manufacturing processes. Until the 1920s, products were advertised in strictly functional terms, attempting to persuade people by appealing to their rationale. Simultaneously, the American people at large only bought what they needed, and very little uh, luxury goods were purchased outside of the upper classes. But they took it upon himself and his associates to transform the mindset of the public from that of needs to one of desires. Using his uncle Freud's work, he would again appeal to the unconscious feelings of the masses. The products were now advertised with emotional connections, and people began to buy things they didn't need, but wanted. Paul Major, a Wall Street banker of Lehman Brothers, wrote in the 1930s, We must shift America from a, a needs to a desires culture. People must be trained to desire, to want new things, even before the old have been entirely consumed. Man's desires must overshadow his needs. Edward Bernays continued to expand the profession of public relations and frequently wrote about his theories and accomplishments. The techniques Bernays employed were later used in the 1930s by the Nazi party to mold the attitudes and perspectives of the German people. Joseph Goebbels was the foremost supporter of this idea and became the Nazi's minister for propaganda. As his inspiration, Goebbels cited a book by Bernays on crowd psychology. In the 1950s, during the Cold War, the Nays would be called upon by the CIA to launch a public relations campaign to convince the American public that Colonel Arbenz of Guatemala, who would become president in 1951, was a ruthless communist dictator. In reality, Arbenz was a democratic socialist with no connections to Stalin or Moscow. Arbenz had promised the American people, uh, sorry, the Guatemalan people, uh, that he would work in order to reform land rights and ensure that the country's resources were used to benefit the people. The policies our events promoted proved to be disastrous for United Fruit, an American corporation operating in Guatemala at that time. Bernays launched a tirade 
against our values, producing falsified news reports, persuading influential journalists to write reports critical of our values administration, and even staging mock anti-American protests in Guatemala. The American public was outraged and insisted the government intervene. This gave the CIA and the United Fruit the perfect opportunity. Agents in Guatemala trained the rebel army, staged the coup, and removed Arbenz from power. After the president was gone, a new administration was brought in that was sympathetic to the needs of American business. Public relations have been largely responsible for modern advertising techniques, and these shape our world in ways we cannot fathom. We are bombarded every single day by messages, advertisements, commercials that tell us what to buy, how to act, and how to think. <coughs> Experts in ancient Greek culture say that people back then didn't see their thoughts as belonging to them. When ancient Greeks had a thought, it occurred to them as a god or goddess giving them an order. Apollo was telling them to be brave, Athena was telling them to fall in love. Now our people here are sour with their commercial for sour cream potato chips, and rational to buy, but they now they call this free will. <laughs> At least the ancient Greeks were being honest. <laughs> okay, so our second case study. Fast forward to 1961, Yale University. University. Psychologist Stanley Milgram thought of a series of experiments to test the connection between authority and oh. <laughs> yeah. to test the connection between authority and obedience. Milgram was fascinated by the Second World War, particularly how many had been seemingly complacent of the Nazi regime and had willingly carried out the plethora of atrocities committed. Milgram quietly put an advertisement in newspapers, asking for volunteers for a study on memory and learning. The participants arrived at the laboratory and took slips of paper to determine their role in the experiment, teacher or learner. However, it was impossible for the volunteers to choose learner, as the all the slips read teacher. The learner would instead be played by an actor. This was staged so that all the participants would be teachers, enabling Milgram to conduct a real uh, experiment on obedience. The teacher and the dummy learner were then separated. They were placed in different rooms where they could hear each other, but not see each other. The experimenter was in the same room as the teacher and instructed them on what to do. At the start, the teacher was given a small electric shock and was told that the same shock would be applied to the... Let's get that right there. There we go. Uh, it was given a small electric shock and told that the same shock would be applied to the uh, learner if they answered questions incorrectly. The teacher would then be given a list of word pairs and gambling them to the learner. The teacher would then read the first word of each pair and read four possible answers. The, leader would press a to, uh, the learner would press a button to indicate his response. If the answer was incorrect, uh, the teacher would administer a shock. If the answer was correct, they would move on to the next set of questions. However, there was one important element in this. For every successive answer the learner got wrong, the voltage of the shock would be increased by 15 volts. Um, and that as the voltage increased, screams of pain would be heard through the internet. In reality, no shocks were administered. These screams were pre-recorded and put on a tape recorder that the actor brought in with them. And they were played when they were given the appropriate signal. To the participants, however, it appeared that they were inflicting terrible electrical shocks on fellow volunteers. At 135 volts, many stopped to question the experiment. They expressed concern for the learner and asked the experimenter if they should stop and check on them. Most continued when they were assured that they would not be held responsible. Gradually, the screams would get worse, and the actor would bang the screen that separated them, begging for the shocks to stop. Eventually, after a certain voltage, there would be no response. No answers, no bang, no screams. The stress of the situation began to break on the subject, and they asked the experimenter to stop the test. If the subject still wanted to stop after four commands, then the experiment was halted. Otherwise, the experimenter would continue until the teacher administered the maximum voltage of 450 volts. Uh, these are particular phrases that the experimenter used to. Uh, if I was the mark, please use some 
considerable. The maximum voltage of 450 volts. This was administered three times before the experiment ended. Just to put that in perspective, 450 volts is nearly twice the UK mains voltage, and this is being applied to people. Well, that's what they think. Now, before Melbourne quizzed, uh, before the study, Melbourne quizzed several senior year psychology students at Yale University and asked them what percentage of the population would be able and willing to go all the way to 450 volts and do it three times. Melbourne got response of about 1%. 1% of people with sadistic tendencies. Melbourne then asked his colleagues, fellow professors, professors, etc., what they would think, and he got a similar response 1%. Now, let's see what you think. We'll break this down by percentages and have that ends up vote. So um, hold on just a minute. So these are the percentages. Pick which one you want to have. Um, and so on. So who thinks nobody did it? Nobody went to 450 volts. Any Gandhis in the audience? <laughs> no, some realism. Okay. Zero to ten percent. So this encapsulates a 1% recommendation by psychologists. I see a few hands clustered around. Okay. 10 to 25%. Medium amount. Some more hands. 25 to 50%. Okay, more. More hands. 50 to 75%. Okay, I'm trying to people there. 75 to 90s. You bloody peasants. <laughs> and for the faintest, some of us in 90s are 100%. That's my friend. Okay, well, 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 let's see. What was the real, real thing? Sixty-five percent of people went all the way to 450 volts and did it three times. Just to put that in perspective, sixty-five percent of this room is 700 people. 700 people willing to go to that voltage. And this isn't just an isolated study, by the way. It's been repeated over and over and over again. When Milgram later published a book detailing the results of the uh, study, he described 19 variations of the experiment. The main variable in this was the proximity between the uh, experimenter and the learner and the teacher. If the teacher was closer to the learner, i.e. could see the learner, then the would the drop. However, if the learner was closer to the experimenter or further away from the teacher, i.e. the intercom was only one way so they couldn't hear the screams or the bang, uh, then obedience would rise. Perhaps the most revealing variation of the inclusion was the inclusion of another second teacher played by a second actor. The actor would be instructed either to follow the procedure as an experimenter, described, as the experimenter described, or to deliberately oppose the procedure. In the cases where the actor opposed the procedure, compliance dropped to a mere 10%. Only 10% of people went all the way. However, in the cases where the actor followed the procedure, the level of compliance shot up. Ninety-three percent. We are profoundly affected by our environment. Our decisions are made largely based not on rationale, but the circumstances under which we make them, and our disposition at the time. Uh, uh, which are determined by values, which in turn are acquired through our culture. In short, we are all victims of culture. So, what does all this mean? What's the problem? The problem is that our entire socio-economic system is based on the assumption of free will as previously described. Democracy, for example, is contingent upon people making reliable judgments about the type of government they want to see. If people's choices could be influenced, then those in positions of power are not really representing the interests of people. Free market capitalism is another example. When management of resources is based not on a method methodology of efficiency, but an ideology of free will, that by everyone acting in their own self-interest will get a society that is humane and mutually beneficial somehow. But it is erroneous 
to base an entire system on such a theory. Even Edward Bernays, Ed, sorry, Edward Bernays, who was a chief proponent of both democracy and capitalism, unwittingly debased the idea in his 1928 book, Propaganda Writing. It's a long one. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed. Our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of humans must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. In almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. It is at this point that we introduce an alternative, a resource-based economy. It is a socio-economic system which takes into account the resources of the earth with the aim of creating a society of abundance where goods and services will be freely available. Simultaneously, our social institu institutions would change with a new emphasis on humanistic values. And there would be an encouraged uh, awareness of our interrelationship between our environment and our health and behaviors. What the? <laughs> this slideshow keeps jumping ahead of me. There we are. In this system, decisions will not be made but arrived at. Many who hear this for the first time do not grasp the implications of this statement. If we understand that all, our problem, all of our problems are fundamentally technical, then there is a logical progression in order to solve them. In building a bridge is, in principle, no different than solving a mathematical equation. We, are, we simply need to account for all the variables stated, uh, stated before. The more information we have, the better our solutions. Humans are not removed from this process of decision making, but the way the process is conducted is entirely different. The crucial element to understand in this is that opinion has no weight, and the results are not subject to interpretation. For example, if you handed the blueprints to an engineer in Japan, they will be able to reproduce the bridge exactly as you designed it. Furthermore, many decisions uh, in our, that are made in society today often revolve around the management of money, budgets, that sort of thing. But when we take a step back, we see that the vast majority of the political establishment is composed of little more than managers, accountants, and secretaries. In a post-scarcity society, such as a resource-based economy, there will be no money. And so po politicians and politics at large, as we see them today, would have little to no practical, fun uh, practical function. Now, it's important to emphasize the distinction between societal decisions, such as the uh, placement of a geothermal power station and individual decisions such as personal pursuits, lifestyle choices, etc. As automated machines replace the vast majority of conventional labor, there will be a great increase in personal and collective freedom. And people may choose to follow what uh, style of uh, lifestyle that they choose. To come back to free will, one of the important implications of a deterministic theory is that individuals are not morally accountable for their actions. To many today, this would seem confusing and disorientating. What do we do of them if they're not responsible? Firstly, in a resource-based economy, the basis for many of the crimes committed today, such as financial deprivation or the neuroses inflicted thereof, would not exist. This is not to say that crime will disappear, but simply that the way in which we uh, resolve and approach crime would be different. It would be treated as an issue in public health, like malaria or coronary heart disease. Orientating the environment people live in to one that fosters cooperation, intimacy, and empathy, we can shift people's values and in turn change their behavior. People are incredibly malleable, as Bernays and Milgram showed. It is time we understood this and moved on. And indeed, we do move on to, there we are. Part three, property, jolly good. Property has become one of the dominant values of modern society. Oh, I believe there's a quote here. There we are, definition for you. 
The idea is that certain objects, places, or ideas is under the jurisdiction of an individual or a group. On the surface, it appears to be quite useful for determining uh, who can utilize what resources in society. The main idea being to prevent theft or misuse of the object in question. However, we need to look at property in another context. Property is essentially controlled restriction. If you claim ownership to something, use it without your permission. This can be used for a basis to exert power, and in turn, power allows you to acquire more property. Property is in fact an outgrowth of scarcity. In an environment where resources are scarce, there needs to be a system of allocation to manage who gets what. And in traditional cultures, as with society today, the main vehicle for acquiring new property was labor. If we look back, many consider the uh, start of the agricultural revolution to also be the start of stratification, and hence property, as food can now be stockpiled, and thus stockpiled unequally. Before, the hunter -gatherer society, uh, before that, hunter-gatherer societies were egalitarian, taking only what the land could provide and sharing it out. However, if resources are abundant, then property becomes meaningless. For example, many of you probably claim that you own your lungs. But what about the air inside your lungs? Do you own that? Your body is still using the oxygen from the air in your lungs, whether you claim to own it or not. Roughly speaking, we go through about 10,000 liters of air every day. Did we pay for all that air? No. Why? Because it's abundant. But air pollution could change all of that. Don't you know that if people could bottle the air, they would? Don't you know that there would be an anti-American uh, air bottling association? And don't you know that they would allow thousands and millions to die for want of breath if they could not pay for air? I'm not blaming anybody. I am just telling how it is. Now, uh, since I enjoy ridiculous examples, uh, let's have a few more. Who here has an iPod? A flurry of hands, okay. Well, in the, in the 2008 trial of the RIAA versus Pirate Bay, the RIAA was seeking $13 million in damages for 34 cases of copyright infringement. That's one per file. If this is true, that means that a download of one file, song, film, or video game is worth about $382,000. Your average 8 gig iPod can hold about 8,000 songs. According to the RIAA, that's worth over $764 million, making it the single most valuable object on planet Earth. <laughs> But wait, there's more. <laughs> Does this mean that all President Obama had to do to bail out the banks was pawn off his music collection? <laughs> Clearly, the President must value his tunes more than American taxpayer dollars. Obviously, it's ridiculous. In the words of Bill Gates, intellectual property has the shelf life of a banana. <laughs> How about another example? Who here has a mortgage? Mortgage. Well, there's not that. Oh, I was expecting more people. Uh, still, you have my pity. <laughs> well, um, uh, Dan Edstrup, was, uh, he's a securitization ed auditor in the United States, uh, and he decided uh, as an experiment to find out who exactly owned the mortgage to his house. Uh, he did a lot of rummaging around, and after a year, he produced this graph to show the transfer of ownership. I'm afraid that's as big as I could get it in high resolution, but uh, as you can see, it is, in fact, needlessly complicated. Uh, there's one particular feature that I like, which you probably can't see, uh, which is up here. Uh, it actually says black hole. It becomes impossible to determine who owns the mortgage. Does this look somewhat familiar? <laughs> We all want a nice place to live, and in a resource-based economy, there will be a wide selection of building designs to choose from, and they will reflect your lifestyle and interest. 
For example, if you're an oceanographer or you just enjoy the sea, then you could live in a detachable sea dome or in a coastal region or even in a city in the sea itself. But maybe one day you decided you had enough and you wanted to move. In today's society, you'd have to find a house for sale that you liked. Uh, you'd have to sell your house, arrange a means of transporting all your furniture and clothes and everything else, and then you still have to worry about the regular hassle of paying bills, rent or mortgage, whatever. Lots of money. In a resource-based economy, however, things would be simplified greatly. You could simply leave your house, move into a, a new one with no forms to fill out. You wouldn't need to transport any luggage, as all amenities would be available on site or close by. You would need nothing but the clothes on your back. Our houses are such unwieldy property that we are often imprisoned rather than housed by them. And now we move on to a similar concept, resource access. Recreation will be simplified greatly in a resource-based economy. Say you wanted to go on a bike ride. It would be a bike would be made available to you from a local distribution center. When you were finished, uh, with the bike, you could return it to the bike distribution center or at the start of the biking trail uh, where it would be maintained, presumably by machines, until somebody else needed it. Kind of like how a public library works. You could, if you wanted, keep it for yourself. But this would entail the obligation of maintaining it yourself. Maybe you use it enough to warrant keeping it for yourself, but the choice is yours. You don't really want to own the bike, you just want to be able to use it when you want to. And that's the, that's the main problem with property, is that it enforces both ownership, and so the right to use the property, but also the obligation to maintain it. And obviously this then suggests why access is more important than property, because we don't really need to own anything. We just want to use it when we want to use it. In a similar way, uh, it's also, yes, resource access. No, this side. In a similar way, it's also ma more materially efficient uh, to do things by re uh, resource access than, say, property. Um, take, for example, uh, cars. Um, there's millions and millions of cars on the planet, but really, uh, they spend most of their time parked in car parks, not really, you know, they're not servicing any passengers. You know, instead, why don't we have cars that were designed so that when they dropped a passenger off, they could be guided by GPS or satellite, or, you know, whatever, to pick up another passenger nearby and transfer them and, and the process continues so that the cars are only really out of service when they're not in use. And this leads to another distortion on a slight tangent that really property distorts the value of objects. A car is simply a mode of transport, a tool to get from A to B. <laughs> but, in our, but in our culture, cars have become, cars have become status symbols. Uh, and despite their relative inefficiency, their relatively low speed, and the relatively high risk associated by traveling by car, then you know, people still love to own an, a fancy car. But I think, to summarize the issue on property, there's a, a lovely quote by, by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The first man who, having enclosed a piece of ground, bethought himself of saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the real founder of civil society. From how many crimes, wars, and murders, from how many horrors and misfortunes, might not anyone have saved mankind by pulling up the stakes or filling up the ditch and crying to his fellows, beware of listening to this imposter. You are undone if you once forget that the fruits of the earth belong to us all and the earth itself to nobody. Right, let's wrap this up. Fundamentally, property, like free will, is nothing more than a tool for our convenience. Just as Ptolemy's model caused endless confusion, our cultural assumptions have lended themselves to a society in decay, rife with stratification and distorted value systems that prevents people from looking beyond the familiar. Curiously, because Ptolemy was a, a scientist, he encouraged people to challenge the status quo and search for their own answers. At the heart of our problems on this planet lies the monetary institution and the cultural assumptions that shield it. Now we can see it in all its glory. 
Nice little graphic. And to finish as a whole, another little quote that I relish. Only when the last tree has died and the last river been poisoned and the last fish been caught, will we realize that we cannot eat money.